Good morning. My name is Bishop Michael A. Clayton, Sr. of the Gospel Spreading Church. And I'm also the pastor of the Philadelphia Church of God. So, how in the world are you today? Let me say it a different way. How are you, family of God? Hey, we're all family, family of God. And we have a lot to praise God for and rejoice about. According to 1 Peter 2 and 9, God has some great titles for us. He says that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and it says peculiar, but better, better translated, God's special people. And God made us this so that we could show forth his praises. Amen? Because he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we have a lot to pray about, a lot to thank God for, and a lot to rejoice about. Because he has done great things, and holy is his name. So I think it's just appropriate on the Lord's Day for us to just take out a few minutes just to praise him. Can we do that today? As the psalmist said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. So repeat after me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Heavenly Father, heaven and earth are praising you. And we praise you. Because we have breath, we praise you. And we bless your holy name. Amen. 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 Praise be the name of the Lord. I hope you praise him too. The word of God says, praise is comely for the upright. Is that talking about you? then you need to be praising God today. Amen? Every day and all day, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and get silent before him. Dear Heavenly Father, loving God, we thank you so much for giving us another opportunity to gather together virtually as a body of believers, as a community of believers, just to worship you and to praise you and give thanks to you. We praise you, Heavenly Father, for who you are, all that you've done, all that you're doing, all that you're going to do. And we realize and we thank you because you have done great and marvelous things in our lives. We thank you most of all for your amazing love, the love that caused you to send your one and only unique son, Jesus Christ, into the world to atone for our sins. And we praise you, Jesus, for willingly leaving your throne, high throne in glory, and humbling yourself all the way down to the death of the cross to take the punishment that we deserve. Oh, how we praise you. We praise you, Holy Spirit, for drawing us to the Father and the Son, convicting us of sin, give us, giving us faith to believe. And when we repented of our sins, you completely saved us, giving us eternal life, eternal salvation, and forgiving us from all our sins, past, present, and future. So today, Heavenly Father, we sit before you as empty vessels waiting to be filled. You sit at the head of the table, which is your rightful place, and feed us from manna from on high. I'm asking you, Jesus, in the name of your Son, in the name and your name to fill me with your Holy Spirit for this task that you're giving me. I don't want to be seen or heard. I just want you to use my body, use my mouth, use my mind to glorify you. And Lord, as you speak to my heart through your Holy Spirit, let it come from your heart to my heart, from my heart to all those who are participating today and who will participate when they see this video recording. So today, 
I'm thanking you for filling me with your spirit. And I'm asking you to send forth your spirit to touch and fill everyone who are under the sound of my voice today and will be under the sound of my voice. I ask this in the matchless name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. 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 Let the church say amen. Say amen again. Say amen again. One for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Spirit. So, in our message last week, we worked through the topic, Church, Let's Get to Work. And we're going to have a follow-up to that, not this week, but be on the lookout for a constant contact email because I'm sending you a email that will give you some ideas for how you can jumpstart serving God during this coronavirus pandemic. And I'm asking you for your ideas, you creative people, God has made you creative, to share and add to this list and also to share your experiences of how God blessed you and used you as you put these ideas into practice. I'm looking forward to great things when we hear from you. Amen. But this week, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, we will delve into the topic, the eternal state. That's our topic for the day, the eternal state. We are returning to our series of messages on eschatology. Okay, teaching you a new word if you don't know it. Say eschatology, all right? Eschatology is the study of what the Bible says is going to happen in the end times. It means the doctrine of last things. So, repeat after me. Speak, Lord Jesus. That's what we want him to do. All right. Praise God, praise God, praise God. He's brought us through our gracious Father God has carried us through another unprecedented, turbulent, chaotic week of more deception and corruption from the top of our government. It seems like we're getting lower and lower and lower. But that's all right. The Bible tells us where sin doth abound, the grace of God abounds much more. Among the many other illegal and or outrageous things, the head of our country is now openly tampering with our right to vote. Can you believe that? Hmm. This is the bedrock of our democratic republic. He has appointed one of his cronies as the head of the U.S. Postal Service. And this crony is putting in place rules and procedures that are meant to slow down the delivery of mail. Have you noticed that your mail is coming to you late? I have. Okay, the goal is to disenfranchise people by not delivering their mail-in ballots for the November 3rd, 2020 national election on time. This way, their plan is that their votes won't get there and get back on time, and they will not be counted. This is the epitome of voter suppression. And this is all done in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, where people are concerned about the danger of going out to the polls to cast their votes. This is unconscionable. Meanwhile, the COVID-19 cases and death are accelerating across the planet, across the United States. And as born again believers, as saints of God, we should really be concerned about the injustice and the thousands of unavoidable deaths that could have taken place. I know it touches my heart. The rhetoric and deception of reopening our economy, reopening, reopening our schools, and the so-called dangers of voting by mail are motivated selfishly by a desire to win the presidential election. And what else is outrageous that uh, the head of our country and his wife just sent for 
their mail-in ballots, their absentee ballots from Florida. But remember these two words, but God, all right? But God, but God. God is sovereign and he is actively working for his glory. He's actively working for our behalf, on our behalf during this time of crisis. And it doesn't matter whether we see it or not. He's working. Psalms 1, Psalms 18, verse 2, is filled with many incredible promises of God's protection. All in this one verse. Open up your Bibles. Let's read what it says. And I'm going to read from the New King James Version. It says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, and whom I will touch, and whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Did you hear all of those promises of God's protection? God is our rock, he's our fortress, he's our deliverer, he's our strength, he's our shield, he's the horn of our salvation, and he's also our stronghold. Isn't that something? So God is not asleep at the wheel. Don't you think he is? He sees the sin and the wickedness that has taken place in our world. Yes, he does. All right? He's omniscient and omnipresent. And God said that the judgment of these wicked people is coming quickly. No worries, no worries. Trust in God. Because it doesn't matter how crazy things get in our individual lives and in the world today. Never forget this. God is sovereign and he's going to make everything right. And as I said before, we should be concerned about that. This is why I'm sharing this with you. So we can partner with God about this coronavirus pandemic. We talked about partners, partners, partnering with God and how God uses our prayers to, to fulfill his will in the world. Let's take a look at the latest uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, data on our globe and in our country. You remember, the United States of America has only 4% of the world's population, but it also has 25%, a quarter of the coronavirus cases. Global cases. Right now, there are 21 million, wow, 641,612 global cases, global deaths. Listen to this, 771,518 deaths. But what about in our country? There are 5,531,313 cases. And what about the deaths in the U.S.? 172,630 deaths. Each one of these deaths represents a person, a life, a soul, a family. It grieves my heart. I, re I recently heard a COVID-19 news report that said, listen to this, maybe this will bring it closer to home to you. It said, one person dies every 60 seconds from the coronavirus in America. and the pace is accelerating. Again, we must partner with God in prayer about the coronavirus pandemic. Remember, Jesus Christ is sovereign over the coronavirus pandemic, over everything that's happening in the globe, in our country, in our lives. He knows the beginning and the ending, and he will take us safely through it. Now let's focus on the word of God, because God's word is good news. As I said before, our topic this morning is the eternal state, the eternal state, the eternal state. 
turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. That's our text today. Our scripture text is Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. And it says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and a former shall not be remembered or come to mind. What a promise that God has made. He said, in this new creation of the new heavens and the new earth, he said, all of the things that happened before won't be remembered. They won't even come to our minds. Hallelujah. Let me refresh your memory. In our past sermons on eschatology or end times, we preached and taught about the following. And we don't have time to really go into it, but maybe go on our YouTube station and look up these messages. First is the rapture of the church, which is the next event on God's prophetic calendar. Nothing's holding back the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is imminent. It could happen at any moment. It could happen while we were, are sharing our fellowship around the word of God right now. Immediately in heaven, after the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ takes place for believers. Believers or saints will not be judged for their salvation, but for the work they've done after they were born again and until the rapture or when God takes them home. Jesus will judge the believers, all believers, by what they've done, how they did it, and why they did it when it comes to their labor for him. Following or at, uh, at the same time as the rapture, the great tribulation period will take place on earth. This is the seven year time period when God will pour out his wrath upon unbelieving mankind. The next event that will take place, and there are a lot of little things that happen in between, but I'm just going for the high points. The next event is the second coming of Jesus. And it will take place after the seven year tribulation period. This will usher in the 1000 year millennial kingdom. Satan will be bound for a thousand years and Jesus Christ will rule the world from his throne in Jerusalem, Israel, Jerusalem, right there in the Near East. And he will rule the earth with equity, with justice, and with an iron hand, okay? The great white throne judgment will take place next. All believers will be, all unbelievers, unbelievers will be judged and the names will not be found in the land's book of life, so they would be found guilty. They would be cast in the lake of fire, along with Satan, all of the fallen angels, the antichrist, and the false prophet. They will all be separated from God for eternity and will be in everlasting torment. Next, God will create a new heaven and a new earth. New heavens and a new earth. That's where we start today the eternal state. The final dwelling place for all believers of the ages and all ages will be the new heavens and the new earth, as well as the new Jerusalem. This is where God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, reign for all eternity. Theologians refer to our eternal existence as the eternal state. Both human beings and angels will exist forever. In the eternal state, the saved will live forever with God, whereas the unsaved will be condemned forever to suffer in a lake of fire. Now, the Greek word most often used uh, and translated as eternal is aeonus, 
Now, if you you all who study Greek, forgive me. That's my best my best uh, 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 pronunciation of it. Okay, and from this word we get our word eon. Eon, you've heard of that. This word denotes two things. Uh, one, it denotes having no beginning and no end, and no end, or it denotes having a beginning but no end with respect to time. It denotes not only life, okay, the life without end, but it also denotes a certain quality of life distinguished from mere bi biological life. We know that all believers will receive resurrection or resurrected bodies. We can find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2. So we will not exist during eternity as dismembered bodies or dis dismembered spirits, okay? We won't be floating around as spirits, but we will possess glorified bodies, especially suited for an existence in the eternal state, all right? So what will our glorified bodies be like? Do you want to know? I want to know. There's a man named Henry Holman, and in his book, Eternity, The New Heavens and the New Earth, he lists 15 characteristics of our glorified body. I was thinking about my body, this old house that I had. I was thinking about the occasion that I had and, and how I used to be able to get up in the morning and just jump right out of bed. But one day I got up and I tried to jump right out of bed and my body flopped right back down, sitting on the bed. And he spoke to me in my heart and said, look, little Mike, you better start listening to me. You better sit down, gather yourself, make sure you're steady, then stand up. I'm not talking about you, but I'm sure some of you had that experience. So I, for one, am looking forward to my new glorified body. Hallelujah. So what are these 15 things or characteristics? Characteristic no, number one, it will be physical and material. It will be physical and material. You can look that up in 1 John chapter, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We won't read that now. What I mean is there will be bodies that can be seen and touched, okay? The second characteristic, these will be bodies that will be transformed, all right? We're not talking about the transforming by the renewing of our minds, but we're talking about a transformed body, transformed into the complete likeness of Jesus Christ's body when he was resurrected. And I love the scriptures in 1 John chapter 3, verses one to three, and it says, my paraphrase, beloved, now we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear in the rapture, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, just like him. And everyone who has this hope in them, and then purifies themselves as he is pure. The third characteristic, our resurrected bodies will be recognizable. That means that you will recognize me in glory and I will recognize you. We will have bodies that will be our best selves, looking strong and young and beautiful, no pains, no crooks, no canes. How about that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the real our real selves lives inside this old tabernacle. And we will see ourselves the way God created us to be. And like I said before, you will know me and I will know you. And you say, hey, isn't that uh, Michael Clayton? And I say, yeah. And who are you? Oh, I know who you are. You're my old friend. And we grew up together in the Lord. Isn't that something? Our bodies will be imperishable, number four. 
That means our bodies will be enduring forever. All right? Not subject to decay like this old house is. Number five, our new bodies will be immortal. That means that they will be exempt from death. They will live forever. Number six, our bodies will have supernatural abilities. I'm sorry, I'm not reading these scriptures. Perhaps if you're interested, maybe you can email uh, the Gospel Spirit of Church and perhaps I can send these scriptures to you. But our bodies will have supernatural ability. Okay? Isn't that something? Our bodies will have no more limits to time or space. The sphere of time or space. And we see, can see an example of that when Jesus appeared to his disciples when they were in a closed room, kind of afraid about what might happen to them. Jesus just appeared in the room. Can you imagine that? Bodies that would just be able to appear wherever our minds wanted to take us. Hmm. Hallelujah. Our bodies will be sinless. Okay? No sin. Right now, a part of why we groan because our bodies have been affected by sin. Our bodies will be, number eight, glorified. All right? They will be designed and adapted for heaven. They will be just like Jesus' body. Number nine, our bodies will be unfailing. That means that we will have no more frailty or weaknesses, but our bodies will be. Uh, and, and strong and endued with power. Number 11, our bodies will be heavenly, celestial, bearing the image of Jesus Christ. Our bodies will be radiant, all right? To shine in glory, to shine as the stars. I remember when I was working for, for the school district, and I had this uh, person who worked with me for a time, and I was grooming her to take over for me. And people were talking about how her skin was radiant. And what did she use? She said, I use this kind of lotion, and you can have radiant skin too. We're not talking about that kind of radiant. Okay, we're talking about the radiance of God's glory. All right, they will shine in glory. And a matter of fact, they will shine all through glory and they will shine as the stars shine. Imagine that. Our bodies will be unmarried. Okay. And that's important for us to understand. We are the bride of Christ and we are betrothed and we will be married to the bridegroom, which is Jesus Christ. Enjoy your marriages now. When you get to heaven, there's going to be a new economy there. And number 15, number 14, our bodies will be fully mature. And 15, our bodies will have no negative effects because God is going to make it new. So the body gives a, the Bible gives a few details of what the eternal state would be like. Scriptures tells us that God will create the new heavens and new earth, the new Jerusalem would descend from God to the earth, a uh, celestial city. Uh, in the creation, this in the new creation, the dwelling of God is with men, and he will dwell with us, and we will be his people, and God himself will be with us and be our God. And so shall we be with the Lord forever. Our existence in the eternal state would be markedly different from what we are used to now. Because there will be no, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, because of the old order of things have passed away. The curse that came with sin will never hold sway again. I can hardly imagine a world without pain or sorrow. But that's what God, as God promises. As the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians 2.9, no eye have seen, no ear have heard, 
no mind has conceived the things what that God has prepared for them love him. In our eternal state, our existence will not be marred by bad memories of the old earth. And that's something to think about. I don't know about you, but I think it happens to all of us. Every now and then, our enemy Satan just throws some bad memory on us or things that we've done our old life before we were saved. And it makes us sad. I know it makes me sad, but thank God for salvation in the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses for all things, for all sins. But we won't have any bad memories in the eternal state. Joy will swallow up all distress, all right? The former things will not be remembered, nor will they even come to mind. During the eternal state, uh, it will involve us serving the Lord. It will involve us seeing him face to face. It will involve us living in perfect health. Anyone who has suffered from bad health, and I can witness to you, that's something to look forward to. It will be a place of perfect holiness. And 2 Peter 3.13 says that the new heaven and the new earth will be the home of righteousness. Sin will not cast its shadow anywhere in that realm. From the beginning of creation, it has been God's plan to bring, to bring his redeemed ones to his, this place of completion and glory. No more sin, no more curse, no more death, no more goodbyes, all because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb. In the eternal state, God's perfect plan will be brought to glorious realization and to, and to fruition. And mankind will accomplish its chief end. This is why God created us, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Hallelujah. So in closing, let me say and reiterate again and again and again, we have work to do. Let's get busy. Church, let's get to work. We know that the rapture is imminent. Therefore, we should be watching, praying, waiting, and working until Jesus comes back for us. Because of this great uh, plan that he has for us, we should be living holy lives unto the Lord. The choice is yours today. And as I said before, and I love this scripture, St. John 5, 24, Jesus Christ is speaking. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, he that hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has, had, but has passed from death into life. So you see, the choice is simple. The choice is yours today. Choose Jesus and you choose life. Reject Jesus and you choose death. When you choose Jesus, you choose eternal life in heaven with him forever and ever and ever. If you don't choose Jesus, you choose eternal uh, separation from God and damnation and a lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Again, the choice is up to you. I admonish you, choose Jesus. This is the best decision that you can ever make. And this decision is for today and will impact on your eternity because everyone will live again. The point is, where will you live again? Everyone will have uh, everlasting body. But the point is, what, where will you live with your everlasting body? If you don't know Jesus Christ in the pardon of your sin, a songwriter wrote, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He's already paid for the sin 
that you and I have committed. All you have to do is come to God in repentance, telling him you're sorry for your sin, telling him you want to turn your life around and live for him, telling him that you believe that it was by his finished work on a cross, his suffering, death, uh, burial, and resurrection on the third day that paid for your sin, and that you want to ask him to come into your life and make you a new creation. And I'm a living witness. He will do it. So my final words of admonition and encouragement for all of you today is this. Love our God. Trust our God. Worship and serve him. And you can say it with me. Run the race with purpose. God bless you.